Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today on Dave Cooper Live, where we bring you the people, the products, and the processes, helping us all to build it better. And today, we are talking about change. Dealing with change is overwhelming. Just as we handle one disruption, another crisis replaces it. How does one survive in this new normal and actually dare to thrive in a global economy where the currency is change. Please welcome Dr. Nadia Cheksimbaya, scientist, entrepreneur, TEDx speaker, and author specializing in resilience and reinvention as she identifies the key trends impacting businesses today. Also known as the queen of reinvention, she is the founder and chief reinvention officer of the Reinvention Academy where she is on a one billion mission to help you reinvent yourself, reinvent your company and reinvent the world. But first, before we get into all that, we cannot bring you all of these innovative conversations without our sponsors. So let's take a moment and say thank you to them. Stream Modular, the only logistics company you need to transport your mods, pods, and panels. Our friends at Stream Modular are investing $50 million over the next 25 years to build the technology, solutions, and trailers needed to handle and transport the projects of today and meet the demands of tomorrow. Reach out to their team at StreamModular.com to discuss your next project. CombiLift is the largest global global manufacturer of multi-directional forklifts and straddle carriers, a leader in long load handling solutions offering a free warehouse and site optimization design service. CombiLift helps companies of all sizes and from every industry maximize the capacity, safety, and efficiency of their warehouse and storage facilities. A big thank you to Paul Short and the team at CombiLift for helping us all to build it better. Visit them at combilift.com. Brave Control Solutions, where offsite manufacturing systems that do more than just improve productivity. They have a unique approach to industrialized construction, a lineup of flexible automation systems specifically designed for the construction industry empowered by CAD to Fab and turnkey solutions for 3D volumetric assembly, structural insulated panels, finished wall assemblies, MEP component processing, assembly, kitting, and storage. Learn more at thinkbrave.com. All right. Thanks again to all of our sponsors to continue to bring all of these awesome people onto the show so we can all learn how to build it better. Let's get into it. Let's bring Na Dr. Nadia onto the show. How are you doing, doctor? So happy to be here, Dave. Yeah, uh, super excited to have you on the show today. So thanks. I know you're super busy traveling the world, speaking to everybody, reinventing everybody. So uh, this is going to be a really exciting conversation because our industry of home building is in that same methodology that you teach. Mm -hmm. We need to reinvent ourselves. We need to build it better. We need to get the homeless people off the street and be more sustainable. Uh, but we seem to struggle doing it. So I'm hoping you can help shed some light on that. That's the plan. Let's be practical. Let's share some great numbers and let's see where solutions are. Absolutely. So Dr. Nadia, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, where you're from, and why you're so passionate about teaching others how to survive, how to thrive, how to reinvent, and how to successfully navigate the sea of change. But you only got two minutes to do it. And if you don't tell us all the truth, we might have your mother come on and join us. And then, well, that'll be tricky since she doesn't speak good English, but we'll give it a try anyhow. Well, she doesn't speak any since I was born in the Soviet Union in a part now called Kazakhstan. So I'm a recovering academic. That means long ago, I was a chaired professor in executive education business school. I wrote books. I wrote articles until one of my students who was a CEO of a major agriculture retail conglomerate said, you know, you speak good words. I almost believe you but you've never worked in business. So until you do, all of this is just a blah, blah. So I started my own consulting business with my husband in 2007. We are 16 years into this business. And since then, we built a group of companies. Education is a big part of what we do now with Reinvention Academy, but we're also active in many other areas, including real estate investment, 
connected, of course, to the built environment. For me, my journey with reinvention started with the collapse of my country. I was born in a country that no longer exists. And the way it collapsed, it collapsed with absolutely no warning, no referendum, nobody was prepared. Kazakhstan, my country, was so unprepared that it took us three years to develop our own currency. And that's my where my intellectual curiosity came in. I wanted to understand not only why large systems fail and disappear, but also how can we save a system that deserves to be saved? And my main customers, of course, are companies that are interested in how do we survive and thrive in today's volatile, uncertain, and turbulent environment. Well, thank you for being here. And I know your past is something that I'd love to really dive into, you know, at one of these uh, conversations sometime in the near future. But I really am interested in learning about how we reinvent ourselves in our industry. So we're going to hop right into it, but I'm not going to do it the way I normally do it. I'm not going to start the conversations off with questions. Um, I think maybe what we do is we start with a few statements and maybe we can do some free association where I say something and you share the first thoughts that come to your mind. Sound good? Sounds good. Let's do it. All right. Change is not a project. Uh, that's a big position on mine. That's actually the name of the title of the main intro in this book, Change is Not a Project, and it comes back to data. So I actually want to bring up my slides and explain to you what the heck I'm talking about and what's going on. Just a few decades ago, we went to look at the change as something that happens to us relatively rarely. So all of us go through the life cycle. You all know how a life cycle looks like. The same thing applies to your business. So if you are in a built environment and let's say you are in modular building, you were a startup, if you survive that and that's no more than 5% and you are now in growth or maturity stage, kudos to you. Unfortunately, every living system goes through decline. Good news you don't need to dine, you can die, you can reinvent. You can start a new growth cycle and a new growth cycle and a new growth cycle. And the amazing thing here, you don't need to reinvent your product. You actually can keep doing things with the same product, but you can reinvent your business model, your revenue composition, your payment system. You can lease rather than sell. There are many things you can do around your product or of course, reinvent your product. So now, how we enter into change is not a project. Just a few decades ago, an average life cycle of a typical business model was 75 years. What does that mean? That means you could milk the same cash cow for a very long period of time. You build an executive business, successful business, and just milk it for 30, 40, 50 years without seeing one major change. That also means your employees could, re you know, enter your company after college and retire from your company and never see a major change happen in their life. They're just doing essentially the same old with small incremental change, but it wouldn't be anything massive. 1989, two things happened. Number one, globalization. The fall of Berlin Wall, after that fall of Soviet Union, opening up of China, suddenly you are not competing with your neighborhood. You're competing with the entire world. And second, 1989, scientists finally figured out how to make internet work. And suddenly, not only you're competing with the whole world, but the know-how that was unique to you is now available and Googleable anywhere, everywhere, and instantly diminishes any competitive advantage you had. So suddenly, you don't have 75 years to milk the cow, but you have now 15 years up until about 2002, 2005. And then it shrunk even further. So, Dave, I will ask you a question now. Yeah. What do you think is a life cycle right now? What would be the average across all industries that you project right now? The life cycle for the success and longevity of them? The life cycle. How long can you make money doing about the same thing in business today? Yeah, I would say 75 years. Unfortunately, it's much, much shorter than that. Ah. So the statistics that we track, we do this research every two years. You will notice in 2018, 13.7% of companies were reinventing every less, every year or less. That would be telecom. That would be fast-moving consumer groups. That would be retail. 
yeah. even more of them in 2020. And the built environment would be in the yellow category. So every two to three years, that's where you would have a safe margin right now. You don't have much time because we see 3D printed homes. We see modular homes. We see new chemistry showing up. We see new equipment showing up. And the number that is just staggering in 2022, about every fifth company was reinventing every 12 months or less. This is the speed we've never seen before. So if we remove this, uh, this slide, this is a very long answer to the question, change is not a project. If most of your competitors are reinventing every year to two, you cannot treat it as a one-time project. Now it's becoming a process. It's something you need to plan for. You need to be good at. It needs to be as automatic for you and your team as brushing the teeth. It's not like once in a lifetime, you've never done this before. This massive thing happens. No, it's like taking a shower. If I don't take a shower on a regular basis, I begin to stink. Same with your business. If you don't wash off your product portfolio, your payment system, your customer relations, your team uh, management, they begin to stink as well. You know, Nadia, it's funny, uh, you know, when I said the 75 years, because this industry that we're in of, of home building and construction hasn't really changed in over 100 years. Mm -hmm. 100 and years, you know, when it comes to technology and advancement, it's starting to happen now. Um, so you're saying we need to be changing every 12 to 15 months. Unfortunately or fortunately, this is um, this is the reality. Do I like it myself? I worked in a company in the industry that is even more um, conservative than you are. For a long time, I was head of transformation in the global mining and metals business. And mining essentially has not changed since the Bronze Age. Essentially, if you think of the main steps, that's about what we do uh, now with slightly better equipment. So we are even more conservative when it comes to uh, change. But the reality is even in the most conservative and high investment loan cycles industries, you need to invest with a loan cycle in mind, but you need to reinvent in a short cycle. And again, it may not be your product. It may be a business model. So instead of selling your leasing or instead of leasing your uh, um, thinking of an interesting financial package or incentive for your customers or your end users, depending on, you know, are you in wholesale somewhere in the middle of, a, um, of the value chain or you're selling to the end user. All of that becomes very important. There is a story from a different industry that I love to bring up in most of our conservative industries, yeah. and that's a story from Rolls-Royce. Most of us think of Rolls-Royce as a car manufacturer, but the place where Rolls-Royce makes its money is not cars, it's airplane engines. And the amazing thing is that airplane engines, if you are building an airplane engine in a traditional business model, your job is to produce as many as you can and sell as many as you can per year. That's the measure of success. You sell as much as you can per year. But Rolls-Royce realized that for the customers, for the airlines, the engine is only useful when it's working. So it created a new business model, never changed the product itself. It changed the business model. Now, instead of selling the engine, it started leasing the engine by the hour of flight. So if the engine is bad and it's on the ground, the customer doesn't pay. If the engine is good and it's flying, the customer is paying. It's an interesting proposition for the customer. It's a clear competitive advantage, and it's a natural drive for the engineers to improve the engine to be more reliable. It's a win-win all around called power by the hour, even though the actual product never changed. That is the ultimate reinvention. Power by the hour. All right, here's a quote from philosopher and best-selling author Sapiens, a brief history of humankind, Yuval Noah Harari, who said, Forget programming. The best skills to teach children is reinvention. And he said it as a first sentence in the most respected IT magazine, which is Wired. You need to understand how offensive it is to the entire programming community. When he said the start of that sentence, he said, forget programming. The best skill to teach children is reinvention. And I was like... This is it. This was many years before 2022 
where we saw the highest number of IT professionals fired in a single few months stretch of the fall 2022. If you remember last year, almost every IT giant massively fired with, you know, cumulatively hundreds of IT programmers um, without a job on the street. And they would call me up and say, I thought this is a safe profession. I thought, you know, this automation business and artificial intelligence would not touch us. It would kill the accountants before it would kill our profession. And here's the news. There is no safe profession anymore. Every profession is going through a massive change. And unless you know how to unlearn and relearn, which is essentially what reinvention is, it's irrelevant. You will never be safe. The safety is no longer in the professional identity. The safety is in our skill set that allows us to face the disruption, not waste any time on being upset or angry that disruption is here, whether it's technological or uh, political, or we've seen the horrible fires of Canada coming to America and my heart goes out to anyone who was affected by this. But in the last week, we all saw what's happening with the climate. Or um, it can be social. In my neck of the woods, we're going through a massive war between Russia and Ukraine. And Russia killing tons of people and destroying the infrastructure of Ukraine. It can be any kind of disruption. You can spend your time being very upset about it. Or you can be focused. You can be automated in your processes when it comes to change, your team should be aligned, your skill set and your tool set should be on top of the game so that you can turn the disruption in a, into opportunity while all of your competitors are disoriented and wasting their time. So this weekend I was in uh, Washington, D.C., you mentioned fires at the Innovative Housing, housing Showcase uh, hosted by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, you know, and lots of support from the National Association of Home Builders. The event itself was absolutely amazing. All kinds of innovation, technology, some people not even on the radar that I've ever seen. And I've been in this industry a long time, but the outdoor air quality was terrible. I mean, my eyes were watering, my throat was dry. You know, the, the, the smoke from the Canadian wildfires dripping down the East Coast uh, was an example of how the world is changing. So when we think about people, we think about our planet and our profitability, what to you comes to mind, otherwise known as the triple bottom line? Mm -hmm. Triple bottom line, and I have to um, congratulate uh, the amazing, amazing uh, creator of this concept, John Elkington, who I love. I know personally, we work together. He's an elder uh, at this point. Triple bottom line is the idea he introduced in late 80s, early 90s uh, with a concept that you should not compromise on any of the three Ps, which is profit, people, and planet. And the concept was amazing for its time. But about five years ago, John Elkington took out this concept of the market and was one of the very few, very, very few scientific minds in my lifetime who went to Harvard Business Review and said, I recall my own concept. Triple bottom line was great when I introduced it 30 years ago. It's irrelevant today. Take it out. So why did he recall it? He recalled it because he has a better concept. If you read his book, Green Swans, it's a, um, it's a kind of continuation of conversation on black swans and his idea that capitalism can be regenerative. We don't need to choose between profits and people, between profits and planet. It can work together and all of the things we do with people and the planet can actually be source of incredible competitive advantage. And I worked in this field uh, since 2001 and we would see simple, stupid, simple reinventions that were just incredible in the results. I'll give you an example. Many years ago, um, in a built environment, that would be example, very typical of a built environment, we were looking at the way, how do we reduce transportation costs, CO2 emissions, impact on the climate, while simultaneously having an economic positive in the way paint is delivered. 
And a tiny, tiny reinvention. Instead of delivering paint in a round container, having it in a square container saves massive space in the truck because all that empty space between the containers is filled up while simultaneously saving money per delivery, saving CO2 emissions, saving fuel, uh, decreasing pollution. These are the kind of things that we can bring when we think plus plus. And that's where John Alkinton is today. Green Swans highly recommend the book, uh, the full title of the book, uh, Green Swan the swans the coming boom of regenerative capitalism we'll put that we'll put that in the comments or in a ticker here in just a few moments it's funny you mentioned the paint can somebody gave me the same exact uh you know concept with pizza right we have a pizza box but then we have a round pizza that goes in the square pizza box but then we cut the round pizza into triangles yeah, the whole thing, you know, when you really think about maximizing the value of a pizza box. Of the box, of the delivery of CO2 emissions, yeah. of everything. For sure, for sure. So a quote from your handbook, how to thrive in chaos. What got you here will not get you there. Thoughts? Well, the issue is that when we lived in long cycles, in a very predictable environment, I could essentially find one winning solution. It could be your standard operating procedure. It could be an equipment, the piece of equipment that you know delivers results. It could be a motivation incentive system for your employees, the way you structure your payment to your employees that works very well. It could be a particular insulation material you uh, you work with. I, I will be with our long-term partner now for insulation uh, next week um, in Slovenia on their construction uh, manufacturing site so you can have your favorite no problem the problem is in today's fast moving world what was working for you just a few years ago could be not just neutral it can actually destroy you our own best practices can shoot us in the foot so we need to be very very diligent Carving out the time on a regular basis my suggestion doing it on quarterly basis having short uh, you know, quarterly reinvention coffee, so a reinvention pizza party on Friday afternoon, and go through key drivers of your financial success and see which one of them are still working for you and which one maybe should be rethought. Maybe there's a better piece of equipment. Maybe there's a different standard operating procedure. Maybe it's, there's a different model in your financial structure that might work better. That would be the reason why what got you here is no longer a guarantee that it will take you to the next level. Yeah, and for sure. So as soon as I hang up, I'm going to start reinventing. I like the idea of a reinvent yourself pizza party every Friday. I'm in. My kids will enjoy it too. Absolutely. All right, let's get to some questions, shall we? So why did the Titanic sink? Well, most companies, like most people who you ask, uh, whenever I am working with a corporate world, I will ask them this question and they say, well, what's the question? The iceberg. And that is so tempting to blame the iceberg. That's what we do in business too. Why we had a bad quarter? Well, the competitor introduced a new product or the legislation was not favorable or the supply chain. We're now all seeing the changes in the supply chain is no longer working and it's unpredictable or employees, you know, the older, more reliable employees retired. And there's an assumption that the new generation of employees are a bit more flaky. I have doubts about that as a mother of 19 year old daughter. They're not flaky. They're different. They're driven by different things. They can be very reliable, but the structure relationship with them needs to be very different. So whatever is the reason blaming the Titanic is not helpful. And it's also immature. Titanic sank because of a tons of decisions management made that make it inevitable. Uh, the sinking of Titanic, when you actually open up historical documents. And I first got this connection when I was a director of the executive MBA and a professor in a business school. And one of my colleagues from Spain, Juan Serrano, brought the movie of Titanic into his leadership course, showing the parallels. And I got excited and I started reading all the historic documents 
and looking at that story and correlating that to the research I was doing in sinking companies like Nokia and um, um, Kodak and some of those untouchable and unsinkable giants of business. And what I discovered is very big perils. For example, Titanic had um, uh, one of the best, best radio equipment. And the people who worked on that radio equipment were very committed. They were very highly engaged. They're well-trained. There was no negligence. They were fresh. The two people, they were called lookouts. The two lookouts that were responsible at the moment of the collision, they were completely on task. They were fresh. Their two-hour shift just started. They were not drunk. They were not sleepy. They were on. The problem is they had no binoculars. And when you ask right now, can you imagine the top most advanced ship right now that has no binoculars? Of course you cannot. This is crazy. Why did Titanic not have binoculars? It did, but they were locked up in a cupboard. Nobody even thought of breaking that cupboard because they were so arrogant and so sure, you know, somebody else will sink, but we are untouchable and unsinkable. And that's exactly what I see in business all the time, where there's an assumption that our past is what will protect us. And look at the world around us. Absolute majority of businesses does not survive. The Kodak and Nokia's of our days are not exceptions. Look, in this year alone, we had two of the most massive bank collapses. Two of the most massive, the Silicon Valley Bank and the second one, which was First Nation or something like that. I need to look up the name. If I mispronounce it, forget it. But we are seeing untouchable, unsinkable industry leaders collapsing. This is the new world in which we live. Titanic syndrome, right? I think is what you call it. A corporate disease in which organizations face disruption, bring about their own downfall through arrogance, excessive attachment to past success, or inability to recognize the new and emerging reality. And I think probably just about anybody in this, uh, uh, in this conversation right now, or if you're watching it later, can probably relate to being with a company or someone who said, well, this is how we've always done it and it's always worked. So why change it? 100%. Titanic syndrome is, is, syndrome is extremely, extremely prevalent all over the world. We do the studies with thousands of employees in hundreds and hundreds of companies each year. And unfortunately, we see a lot of signs of Titanic syndrome. And of course, those who are already dying do not come to ask us for help. It's too late for them. But we see even in the healthy companies quite often this three signals that we are arrogant about our uh, own position. We are uh, too attached to we've always done it this way or we are debating and pushing things back. Uh, there's three things that we test when we test for Titanic syndrome. And by the way, you can grab this test for free. We have a free 85 page preview of the book and the Titanic test is part of that preview. So if you look at the page, you just grab the materials and you can test your team very quickly. It's only 15 questions. And those 15 questions will immediately give you a sign of how you're doing and where you are. We try to make it a fun, interactive, as you can see on the screen right now, a very interactive handbook with exercises. So grab your 85 page download and do the test. In the test, we test three areas. Number one, how good are you and your team as anticipators of change? So anticipating change, that's your first skill set. Can you notice the incoming risk? Are you paying attention? Are you doing systemic steps to notice the risks and opportunities in today's volatile environment? Number two, designing change, right? Anticipating change is the first capacity. Number two, designing change. Can you develop a concept before you jump into the steps? And this is so important because we notice that even when the massive corporations, companies often make a decision without really thinking it through, and then they turn out to be impossible to implement. I had a client some recently with headquarters in Germany that after they already approved the decision with a board, it turned out in some of their major subsidiaries like Mexico, it was not even legal. So you need to spend time and seeing, is this idea 
is even valid, possible, implementable at the legal standpoint, human resource, financial opportunity, technical standpoint, and so on. So designing change, anticipating change, designing change, and finally implementing change. We live in a world where we assume that if the idea is good, the implementation will take care of itself. And you all know that's simply not yeah. true. And the reason it's even less true right now is because our employees are exhausted and overwhelmed. I want to show you the data from this May, May 2023, from a wonderful research, and you can read more in Harvard Business Review. So it comes from uh, HBR and Gartner, if we can show my slide. The reality is that our employees are suffocating, and they're suffocating objectively. In 2016, a typical company would have two planned change a year. Two. That's already more than we had in the 90s, where it was, you know, one planned change in 10 years. Now it's two per year in 2016. In 2022, that was 10 planned changes a year. That can be moving to a new CRP system. That would be a plan change. That would be moving to a new supplier. That would be a plan system change. That could be a different way we calculate fixed and uh, variable part of the salary of our employees. Whatever is that that you're changing. But 2 to 10, that's a massive, massive growth. And our employees are suffocating under this amount of change with no real thoughtful uh, preparation and training and the skill set in these three areas, anticipating change, designing change, and implementing change. As a result, in 2016, about 74% of employees were willing to support change. Right now, just 43%. It's a massive drop in support. It's a huge change fatigue. And we as leaders and organizations have to do it differently, have to be very, very clear that it's no longer something we do on the weekends or last thing on Friday evening, that we need to allocate time and resources. We need to organize it the way we organize our budgeting or the way we organize our other functions, operations. This cannot be a sidekick skunk work thing we put last on our agenda item. Uh, the, the the numbers are, you know, staggering. And, and, you know, when you look at it, it's almost hard to even fathom that's what it is. And that's what needs to happen when we look at this. So can you be a little bit more literal uh, and give some real examples that maybe you've experienced, you know, why and, you know, do the businesses sink and how maybe, you know, that company was able to turn it around? Do you have some real world experiences you can share with us? Most of them I am not able to share because of the NDA, so I will have to use public examples. In my case, I'm very honored that I've worked with many different companies. Yeah. And occasionally my recommendation was there's no way to save this. What we can do is to kill it in the most effective, uh, cost efficient and people kind, people friendly way. Because your reputation on the market will stay whether your organization is still here or not. So you cannot just throw your people on the, uh, on the street and pretend that it never happened. In most cases, however, we can reinvent. So stories that are very visible that are now on everyone's mind. There's a new movie out on the turnaround in BlackBerry that never happened. BlackBerry was the first smartphone and it meteorologically went up and then destroyed itself very quickly. Highly recommend a movie. Blackberry just came out, and that would be a typical new Titanic story. That that is a mass mass ship that uh, was not able to reinvent. But there's tons of tiny examples of what can be done. So things around product reinvention, things around process reinvention, and so on are very, very possible, and you probably see them all around you. So when I look at things that are happening around me, I noticed, for example, in simple equipment, shaving off even a little bit of material is becoming a first place where most things start with reinvention. Is thinking, where do we have a little bit of waste that is not necessary. Um, for a long time, I would use an example in my previous book of scissors. It was scissors we bought in a store. And as all scissors, it would normal handles, but 
you know you're applying pressure only on the inner part of the two ovals where you stick your hands, where the outer part actually doesn't need to be stiff. It doesn't need to be firm because you will never apply pressure there. So the company just removed the material on the outside of the scissors and kept the super firm material on the inside where you will actually apply a pressure when you are cutting. Those would be the typical examples of where do you start. You start with where do we have just a millimeter or you know an inch of waste right now? And how can we readjust what we do? Because over a period of time, that inch accumulates into millions and millions of dollars. In 2005, we were working as a part of a very large team. I was still a PhD student at Case Western Reserve, and we were working with Walmart that was working on sustainability and rethinking its product portfolio along, along the line of regenerative capitalism. And one thing that they did, they looked at all of their packaging, and one product purchaser was working with a kid toy set, the tea set that very often kids use as a fake tea set where you have little saucers and little cups and all of that. And they realized that a little bit of that package, about one inch, was unnecessary, that it would be no loss to the marketing presentation of the package, that it would be nothing protect, you know, no loss in the protection of qualities of the package. Just one inch, that's it. In that one reinvention, they were able to save some thousands of trees, huge masses of water, of course, removed CO2 emissions and pollution and transportation costs of $3.5 million in savings because suddenly they could pack more of the sets into a container. This is the kind of things you would start with. But in most cases, you can go away from reinventing the product because reinventing your product is a bit more complex, takes more time, and generally speaking, needs investment. So my recommendation is always, if you're beginning to feel like you are following Nokia and Kodak and Toys R Us and Silicon Valley Bank, if it begins to smell a little bit like Titanic syndrome, start with low-hanging fruit. Start with something tangible and start with quick wins. We're tired. Post-COVID, we're still exhausted. Inflation is here. We're not clear. Are we in a bull market or are we in recession? Everyone is not clear what the heck is going on. We need quick wins. We need a boost in the arm. And our people need that kind of sense of victory. So start small and start with low-hanging fruit. You know, uh, that was such a great example of shifting from the linear throwaway economy into a more lasting, more abundant, uh, more sustainable version of itself. So well done. Thank you for that. Absolutely. These are the most exciting stories. It doesn't need to be either or. We don't need to choose. Do we feel proud of our work or do we feel good about our wallet? It can be both. And more and more often, our ingenuity suggests that it is both, and we can create incredible new products and solutions that are simultaneously vi like massively economically viable and really, really good for the planet and our people. Tell you what, why don't we go and just put a couple comments up real uh, quick here. We got uh, CEO of the Americas, Etienne Gubler. Uh, greetings from Minnesota. Good to see you, Etienne. He, only, he covers North America, Central America, South America now. So good to see you. Joel Hopkins is also with us today. Uh, he says, good afternoon, Dave Cooper, Jennifer Crocus. So good afternoon to you as well. Hey, no stranger to owning a bunch of businesses and uh, really changing the way the world works. Steve Burrows, yes. greetings from Southern California. Hey, Steve, it's great to see you. Um, they just launched a new product. Henry Mickelberg, obviously regenerative capitalism is not something that is realistic in the U.S., but definitely possible in the EU. Is your book predicted uh, predicated upon the U.S. or EU? Uh, the last one was written during COVID right here in the US. I live in Columbus, Ohio, and it's all about pragmatic tools you can use with your um, team, with your community right now. I want to address this issue about EU versus US. I think the reliance on the context and the environment, and I come from the world where we were heavily reliant on regulative environment, right? Soviet Union was driving every inch of our life. At the moment of collapse, 
right before the collapse, graduating from college, my government would decide where I would work. So after the college, I get a sleep a paper where my government says, you're going to live in this town, you're going to have this job, this is your salary. And if you refuse to take this job, being unemployed in our country is illegal, so we'll put you to jail. So I lived in a highly regulated environment that, by the way, killed my great-grandfather and jailed and tortured my grandfather, who killed himself after the jail sentence in 1975. So this idea that a regulated environment is something that should be the defining um, playground, the, the definition of our playground, for me, even though that's where I grew up, is a very dangerous um, proposition. So I would invite you to think that the regulative space, while it does make certain things more or less favorable, EU versus US, in most cases, the startups and the big corporations that are winning right now are the ones that are defining their own rules and are ready to impact and reinvent even the regulative environment itself. I'll give you an example of um, a washing machine company. I need to check the name. I, I forgot the name of the company that starts with M, um, May something. But for the longest time, they were the best in the world for water efficiency, and nobody else would compete with them. And they would work very heavily to change the regulation that would make them the best in class machine with the best water efficiency. So there is a way to create a more sustainable regulatory environment while simultaneously creating a massive competitive advantage for yourself. So yes, there is a difference. And I truly think that we can become much stronger than our competitive environment. And I don't speak of it as an idealist. I speak of it as a person who built her first business in the post-collapse Soviet Union. And for me, that is the name of a game. Can I actually change the rules rather than choosing between the two set of rules, EU versus US? Great question, Henry, and great answer, well, Dr. Right. Nadia. Thank you very much. All right, we have uh, Gregory Laha. You're either evolving or you're moving backwards. There is not passive position. Absolutely. Period. And today it's absolutely the case. Not only um, you're even, uh, either evolving, but as um, it was Gregory who said that. Yep, Gregory Laha. Uh, uh, you are moving backwards, meaning... The world is moving so fast that even if you're standing still, it's like you're an escalator moving backwards. So you need to become very clear. You like it, you don't like it. Change is coming. Either you will participate in it willingly and be proactive, or you will be dragged, kicking and screaming by your competitors, by regulators, by new tech, by whoever is shaping the rules of the game. And that is the only choice we have. Change. Got to change. All right. Uh, Denise says, great awareness. Thank you for joining us, Jen Denise. And Joris Wisniewski, hey, change, hashtag change is good. Thank you as well, uh, Jory. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of other comments and stuff coming through. We will get to uh, those here at a later time. We're running a, a little bit out of time here. So let's, let's kind of wrap up and summarize here if we can. What are the three super important key trends that all businesses must pay attention to? And if that's too much for the audience to take only in three, you know, what is the one thing we should all be looking out for? Number one, change is no longer something that happens once every 10, 20 or 30 years. It's something that happens at best uh, every few months. And if you are in many, many industries, it's something that happens every few weeks. In this environment, you can no longer treat change as a project as something you create as this massive thing that we've never done, but it becomes as normal as taking a shower for yourself, for your team, for your customers. It's a non-negotiable. It's not a project. Second thing, change today is the strategy. You may not know which product will win, which uh, pricing policy will win, which market will be good. Everything is moving so fast 
looking at just one choice is no longer relevant. We have to look at a portfolio of reinvention initiatives, knowing that managing change, the reinvention portfolio where we are constantly reinventing and changing and moving forward is the only way forward. We don't know which of the seeds will be huge and successful and which will just disappear. But we do know that the change itself, constantly reinventing on a regular basis, is the winning strategy today. Wherever it will land, whether it will be on pricing, on the market, on the product, is less relevant today. And number three, your people are exhausted. They're scared. They're confused. So it becomes on us as the leaders to create an approach to change that is less random, less project focus, and more systematic, more fun, more expected, more quick low hanging fruit, quick wins, something that we can actually at least tolerate, if not enjoy. I've seen companies going from hating change to actually becoming champions of change just because they introduce quarterly change retreats. Short, simple, half a day on Friday, everyone throwing in ideas, manageable, clear results, and suddenly you are looking at a completely different mindset around change and completely different engagement from your employees. Awesome. So... Peter Molinar says, change is the only constant. Thank you for joining Amen. us, Peter. Great, great to see you. And Greg Ugaldi, this is the uh, past chair of the National Association of Home Builders. He is the guy that updates the president of the United States a couple times a year on the home building industry. Greg, always good to see you as well. Nadia, thank you so much for uh, taking the time out of your uh, out of your busy schedule to join us today. I, I, I'm going to take a kind of a wrap up of kind of what you said here. And, and basically what I learned is don't be afraid to break the glass. You have the binoculars, you have the power, break the glass, look out for your business and your people and embrace the change and connect with Nadia in the links below. You'll learn a whole bunch. And I'd be willing to bet if you're struggling to make a difference in your business, uh, it's pretty clear to me that you are the person that can help them. It's Thank my you. honor to be here. And as a person who benefits from uh, the work you do, living in a beautiful home in a very comfortable environment, I really appreciate the chance to hopefully help the industry become the best version of itself in today's turbulent and uncertain environment. I think what this industry has done in a post-war so, uh, post reality what it has done for the growth of America. You have always been the industry that creates this country. And this is an opportunity to reclaim that path again. Awesome. Also had Tim Sims. Uh, Tim, we will answer your question after the show here. Thank you so much for posting your question as well. All right, Dr. Nadia, please uh, stay right where you're at. We'll come back to you after the outro and wrap up off air here. But for the rest of you out there, guess what? It's Monday. And that means we have four and a half more days to make it better. So get out there and let's start working. I love my Mondays. We'll see you Wednesday, 1 p.m. I'm Dave Cooper, Dr. Nadia. Thank you so much. Bye now. What an amazing show. Thank you to all of our sponsors for helping us to continue to bring 